Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Climate Museum. My name is Miranda Massey, and I am our director. Our mission is to inspire action on the climate crisis through interdisciplinary programming with a focus on building dialogue and community and movement toward just solutions. It's a huge pleasure today to present the program Reimagining Museums for Climate Action, a conversation with Mark Chambers, who directs New York City's Department of Sustainability. Um, and uh, the conversation that we're gonna have is inspired by a competition of the same name that you'll be hearing a little bit more about. Today's event starts with a 16 minute film captured earlier this month in which Mark and I discussed some of the broad themes raised by this competition. And then there will be an opportunity for Q and A um, and for your comments and thoughts. We really encourage you to be as interactive as possible throughout this event. Please use the chat for comments and for your questions. Where it is specifically a question that you'd like Mark and me to address, please add a capital Q and a colon to highlight that it's a question and draw our team's attention to it. Our team will be shipping your questions over to us uh, and we look forward to hearing what they are. Please consider following us on this channel and across social media. Our tag is Climate Museum um, everywhere we are. Um, and please like, share, and subscribe so we can help build our online presence in this new online world. There will be resources posted in a blog um, that you can find either in the chat in a few seconds or by going to our website that helps showcase the incredible work that's being done across the cultural institutional sector in this area um, beyond the bounds of this conversation so that you can engage further. Looking forward to hearing from you. And now let's watch the film together. Hello, my name is Miranda Massey. I direct the Climate Museum in New York City. And I'm also honored to serve on the jury for the design competition, Reimagining Museums for Climate Action, which has received hundreds of entries from all over the world. And our charge as jurors will be to select eight finalists whose work will be displayed at the site of the next United Nations meeting on the climate crisis. Jurors are having conversations around the world with different experts on design and the climate crisis. And earlier today, it was my huge pleasure and honor to speak with Mark Chambers, who's the Director of Sustainability for New York City. Mark, first, can you say who you are and, and what your role is? Sure. Uh my name is Mark Chambers. I am the Director of Sustainability for New York City, uh, what I often refer to as our great American sanctuary city that is New York. Uh, and so I've been in this role for uh, almost four years now, uh, and I am responsible for painting a clear picture of where New York needs to be over the next five years, 50, 100 years in terms of our relationship to our home planet. Uh, and that has a lot to do with all the underpinning systems of our society that help us to really kind of figure out how we're going to survive as a species and how we're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and how we're going to change a lot of the pillars that um, and the systems that support us in a way that are more inclusive and thoughtful and ultimately less demanding on resources. I want to start by just saying how thankful I am for the work that you do, for the huge job that you carry and um, I don't think there's anything more important. It's profoundly significant for cities to show the way forward uh, since they're where most people live and that will be increasingly true over the course of the next century, as you know, and to have cities that are being led in the direction of public health and equitability, a safe climate for everyone is, is unbelievably important and I know it's unbelievably hard too. Mark, I don't know if you saw the New York Times this morning that they have a climate scientist talking about California being smacked in the face by what we're seeing. Absolutely. It is yet another example of a confluence of several different emergencies happening. Fire seasons increasingly becoming more devastating is something that is clearly indicative of a changing climate. And it's, and it's something that is impacting us in a way that uh, layers on top of several other problems that we're facing. I mean, this is 
continue on top of extreme heat, one of the hottest summers that we've seen on record, which is something we have to say every year. Um, you layer that on top of other both natural disasters as well as um, uh, social disasters that are that are unfolding, and it's become something in which we are not able to uh, effectively deal with all those crises at the same time. And I think that is the true nature of climate change. It's it's chaos, and I think that we are seeing the the direct results of of our inaction, and we are unfortunately having to dedicate as many resources as possible to be able to to combat that to make sure that we are not losing life and that we are not ultimately kind of reducing the the environment around us that's that's supporting us so it's very devastating it's very tragic to watch and california is not alone in experiencing um some of the real crises around climate right now not alone in the u.s and not alone internationally it's just it's just profound and it does feel like it, within the climate advocacy and, and, and um, climate activist communities, we know that the climate crisis is an inequality multiplier and exacerbator of existing public health challenges. It takes every challenge that we already face socially and intensifies it. Um, and now, as you point out, we're playing catch up rather than thinking proactively about how to mitigate um, and be more resilient and adaptive into the future. And so we need a kind of phase change, I feel, in how we're approaching this as a whole society across the waterfront. And to me, this design competition is exciting because it expresses a growing trend in the cultural institutional sector of orientation toward the climate crisis. And I just think if you, if you sent a good natured, smart Martian sociologist down to earth and try to explain to them how we've let it get to this point. There's a lot to say about that. Um, but one of the things that we would all surely say is enough. It's time for all the different sectors in terms of urban policy and planning, your line of work, in terms of cultural institutions, in terms of schooling, Everything we do as, as a species should be oriented toward addressing this crisis now. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that you've hit the nail direct, you know, right on the head. How we, um, how we move forward from here, how we capture this moment in our in collective action will define generations to come. It will also define if there are generations to come. It, it's not something that is so... Um, I, I don't say that to be just bombastic. It is literally um, something that we are um, looking at from a species level um, survival. And I think that cultural institutions in particular, the design community, which I'm a part of, uh, you know, I've you know, been an architect for quite some time now, and I think there's a certain skill set around uh, uh, being able to, uh, to kind of envision and then cultivate that into the physical reality. Uh, there's an opportunity, but there's also a responsibility to use design to be able to reflect where we are right now and where we need to be. Designers have a responsibility to curate a thoughtful, inclusive future for generations to come because the work that they do is lasting. And if it's not something that is, is tackling and building a galvanized response to climate change, then we're not doing what we need to be doing. There's nothing more important than the climate crisis that will ever have happened to our species. We can't sit on our hands and engage in business as usual, just like the banks can't, the city governments can't, the schools can't. Cultural institutions have to get in the game and orient toward this crisis. It threatens all of our missions, right? How could you even have a public serving mission if you're not oriented toward the climate crisis? Absolutely. And I think that cultural institutions and museums, for example, uh, they're not new to this, right? They have a history of being able to utilize both the physical space as well as the exhibits to tell stories, to tell narratives. Um, you know, you walk into, any, you know, most museums and there is a, there's a designed grand entrance that showcases the fact that what you're about to see is incredibly important. Baked into how that happens is telling you what matters, what's important. And so for a long time, you know, museums have not necessarily done a great job of making that experience, that narrative, one that is inclusive. You know, they, they kind of often, you know, point in a direction um, that oftentimes reinforces some of the 
the uh, kind of social hierarchical structures that make it difficult for everyone to participate in our society. And I think that is something that uh, museums, again, they have an experience of knowing how to, uh, to shape uh, an experience and uh, shape a, uh, an environment for people. And I think now more than ever, they can use those skills to be able to tell complete stories and stories that will impact how everyone viewing, everyone walking through their halls, everyone experiencing those, uh, those narratives uh, can be inspired to do more, inspired to uh, not sit on the sidelines. Uh, and they can do that in a way that I honestly um, is being an example of how everyone should be acting no matter what sector you're in. We have to provide spaces that are both candid and emotionally supportive for all of these really difficult conversations because there's pain ahead. We can, we can choose a lot of things about, about that pain, um, but we can't choose whether or not there's going to be a lot of trauma and suffering caused by the climate change that's already baked into what we've done. Um, and uh, being, finding the right way to be straightforward about that without causing people to shut down in a crisis of anxiety is something I think that both design and clearly articulated city policy, but also that cultural institutions are really well situated to do. Absolutely, and to do that in a way that addresses the intersectionality of, of meeting people where they are, right? So you, you know, right now in cities all across the, the country, if not around the world, you know, there are people dealing with all of these uh, um, climate related issues while simultaneously going out every day to, uh, to protest and show support for black lives. Like that, that kind of confluence and that need to kind of address simultaneous both social issues as well as environmental issues is, the, is part of the complex and messy dialogue that has to happen right now. And museums and cultural institutions uh, are the perfect place to be able to bring all of those things together and allow for us to have that that space to be able to experience, understand, and uh, process uh, where we are right now uh, in addition to, to where we need to be. And I think that a lot of the work I do looks at the future of where the city needs to be. Um, and I'm, I'm always reminded of, there's this, uh, this art exhibit that was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I went, I, went to school in Pittsburgh and they, uh, it was called the Last Billboard Art Exhibit. And there was an artist named uh, Alicia Wormsley and she, it's about two years ago, she did an art exhibit on a giant billboard, all kind of black with white um, typeface on it that said, there are black people in the future. That's it. That was the extent of the exhibit. That was, that was all it was. Uh, and it was kind of a shout out to a lot of us kind of sci-fi nerds and so forth. But, it, but it, it was very clear in explaining the fact that as we plan for futures, as we think about the possible futures that we are navigating towards together and protecting and defining what we, we are, uh, what we will tolerate and what we will not tolerate, it must be one that is planned and is, it is inclusive of everybody. And we have to do the hard work now to make sure that you know, we are uh, creating all of the, the checks and balances so that uh, we are effectively building out and curating the experience for those people in museums and cultural institutions, the same way in which the American Disabilities Act created an environment where uh, you know, we were able to tackle ableism in terms of being enter, you know, enter into museums um, uh, with ramps and, and with the ability to have everyone experience that same grand opening I mentioned before. We create these boundaries, we create these guardrails, we create these, these visions of what exactly we think um, is going to allow for as many people to be involved as possible. And then we allow for the creatives and the designers and every part of our you know, amazing society to fill in those voids and give us really rich experiences. That's the way we're gonna get forward and way we're gonna move forward and tackle this. It's gonna be with creatives helping to articulate, demystify and give us really clear visions of a possible future that is inclusive of everyone and one that uh, supports those that have been historically removed from that narrative. And I'm, ex I'm here for it like 100%. Also 100% here and one of the things that's been giving me hope and I'm, this is built on years of work by frontline and fenceline activist communities 
making making the argument which is unassailable that racism and environmental and climate crisis are completely interlocking problems that we have to address together. They're built into each other in a really fundamental way. But I think a combination of, of that work shifts within the climate movement, the introduction of ideas about the Green New Deal, and then finally the, the Black Lives Matter protests that have been so completely consuming of the whole population since George Floyd's murder, as, as, as you mentioned, have made me feel really, I don't want to say confident because uh, American white supremacy is very, very resilient. Um, but I feel like there is a new consensus and a really broad consensus around the view that whatever else happens going forward, we have got to clean out the rot at the center of American democracy, which is racial hierarchy um, and, and white supremacy. And when you import that into the, the context of the climate crisis in a designing collective, above all collective and community experiences in which people can confront that crisis and think about it in creative and also clear-eyed ways, we won't avoid all the pain that lies ahead, but we will come out the other side with a civilization that we can cherish and that represents what we, what we hold dearest. Absolutely. And I, I'm always reminded of, you know, kind of day one in architecture school, um, the first kind of thing we learned is that, you know, design is the first manifestation of intent. And so what do we intend ah. to do? What exactly is our intent right now? Our intent is to survive and our intent is to do that in a way that, you know, uh, acknowledges the the value of black and brown lives. It acknowledges the um, the value of a full spectrum of of contributors to our society, whether it's frontline or or those that are um, that are kind of historically privileged. Everyone is part of, the, of of that future. But what is our intent? And I think our intent has to be something that is very clearly defined. And again, I think that designers and creatives have the ability to, uh, to truly um, provide a, a picture of that intent and to do that in a way that acknowledges the messy progress that we are making and will be making over time and to do that in a way that is, not, uh, is, that is somewhat unapologetic. And I, I'm, I'm very excited for that. everyone and thank you so much for watching the film just as a heads up the credits the credits for that film will run at the end of the event as a whole i'm now absolutely delighted to welcome or i guess re-welcome and reintroduce mark chambers um, who will be joining us for our q a session hello again mark hello hello so good to see you <laughs> it's wonderful to see you again as well we have people watching from all over the world. We have in the house Italy, India, Colombia, Germany, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which we all know from your recent comments in the film has a special place in your heart and a lot of other points around the world. Um, so it's uh, great to have all of you with us and great to know that the chat has been super active. Please keep it that way and keep the questions coming. Um, Mark, I want to start with a, a, a question about the commons, the idea of the commons. And this is partly based on a series of thoughts I had after our last conversation and, and a number of the things you said. And then it was amplified further by remarks made by Jackie Patterson of the NAACP at another event we had last week where she spoke about the absolutely critical role of universal access to the commons. And I've been reflecting on how the very notion of the commons um, and of the public good has been under a concerted attack in the US uh, where it was never as strong as it's been other places to begin with, but that's a whole nother conversation since at least the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 and how we've seen that expressed in attacks on public sector union and attacks on funding for the public good um, in any number of ways, um, deregulation, and the undermining of public institutions um, has been proceeding in a really aggressive way. And in a sense, 
the current at least quadruple crisis of racism, public health, democracy, and climate is almost a logical expression of all of that coming to a head. Um, and the organizers of this amazing design competition clearly feel that museums have a role to play in addressing that and in moving us forward. Um, and uh, I just wanna put out there to you, what, what are your thoughts on that? No, well, I think it's a, it's a very important question and also a very important observation. You know, when I think about the notion of the commons, I think to recent events that we've witnessed and seen in, in real time, particularly the, the impact and the, uh, the important notes from the youth climate movement and youth climate strikes. And, and we've seen you know, young people in the United States um, and around the globe actually taking to the streets and making sure that their demands are heard making sure that their voices are heard for not just clean air and clean water, but um, just communities and making sure that they are going to do what's necessary to ensure a livable future for themselves and for the, the planet on which we all share. And for me, that, that's a, a note around the commons. What it's saying is that there is a strict and clear desire for the commons to be returned to the people. And I think that's something that we are going to have to acknowledge and going to have to really confront in a way that it, that is very important to a lot of the places that you know hold the power to change and to move in those narratives forward museums being one of them um, and i think museums have always held a certain cultural um, pointed presence but what i also want to say is that you know kind of just like they say about respect uh, and power it's you know a lot of things it is uh, it's it's earned it's not given Right. And so I think if museums are going to be a place uh, and cultural institutions are going to be a place that acknowledge that need for democratization of the of the commons, then they are going to have to earn that position. And part of that means making sure that they are creating opportunities and spaces for the people that are most impacted, the people that are in the front lines to be able to tell their own stories. And in doing so, I really believe that those cultural institutions will be doing their part to share in the, the commons being a, a place that can be a source of, of, of clarity and unity and actually momentum to be able to embrace and to champion a lot of the, the changes that we are clearly in need of, um, not just kind of locally in some of our, our, our cities, but across the country and globe. Very much agreed, and and you're taking me right to another point that I wanted to to ask you about, which which came up um, in a glancing way in the film, but which I thought we could dedicate some more time to, and that has to do with the role of the youth movement in utterly transforming the discourse and the debate around the climate emergency, um, and I think that connects to a very important point about the commons because. Part of the business as usual that the youth movement is categorically refusing is the radical, brutalist individualism um, that has been um, uh, trying to assert itself, let's say, as having a kind of hegemony ideologically across our culture. And um, the, the youth climate movement is not having that. They are simply not having that. And it reminds me of the work on the commons. The tragedy of the commons, for those who don't have occasion to know, was a kind of um, conventional received um, piece, of, piece of wisdom about how economics in a collective setting works. And in the original example, if everybody in an English village is allowed uh, to have their sheep graze in the common square, the square will get overgrazed. Um, you apply that to our atmosphere and the analogy to the climate crisis is fairly clear. But uh, Dr. Eleanor Ostrom, who won a Nobel Prize for this work, found that in multiple examples across time and space, um, and I'm now taking Nobel Prize winning work and digesting it into just a few syllables, so uh, uh, sorry for the condensation, um, but that community and communication, and very importantly, social trust 
mean that the tragedy of the commons is absolutely not inevitable and we can instead make the commons a source of generative connection and plenty um, for, for everyone. And it seems to me that the youth movement generally and what you were just saying about the youth movement, youth movement connects very strongly to that work on what the commons can be as opposed to what it has been assumed to be by conservative economists. No, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head and I do agree, you did a great job of, uh, of condensing very complex uh, um, <laughs> theories in, into digestible uh, way for us to, to understand. So look, we, we're in a time now in a time of consequences, and whether those consequences are what we're experiencing from um, wildfires and in heavier storms and um, you know flooding, it's it's a time in which we're there's no longer a place to be where you can ignore that the world is changing around us, and you can no longer ignore that a lot of the imbalances and inequity that a lot of us have been experiencing are directly related to the impacts we're seeing physically. And so whether it is through seeing that in the disproportionate outcomes of the COVID-19 crisis, or just understanding the fact that we're in a place where entrenched fossil fuel interests have significantly and deeply entrenched themselves into every decision we make from the phones in our pockets, to the shoes on our feet and, and, you know, it is something that we are not easily able to separate ourselves from. But if we take cues from, I think, a lot of incredibly courageous young people who are, uh, in addition to not suffering fools, uh, they have unburdened themselves from some of the, I think, constraints that limit a, a lot of other people's vision around what's possible. And so for me, I am trying to take as many cues as possible from them and from their, you know, kind of, you know, unabashed critique of what, uh, what I'm doing, what all of us are doing, and how quickly we're doing it. And I think that's going to be a, a critical part in compelling us to action. And I think that the, the notion of having this unapologetic critique is something that frees us up from a lot of the mistakes we've made in the past and a lot of optical allyship where we are just saying the things to make everyone feel good as opposed to doing the hard work. And I'm, I'm here for it. Right. right. Ex exactly. There's a, there's a, a breaking open of the illusion of consensus that is absolutely necessary in order for us to reach an actual robust mm -hmm. consensus where we're meeting each other on equal footing and, and communicating about what matters. Um, not always in agreement, no doubt. Uh, there's <laughs> there's uh, fortunately no guarantee of that. Uh, uh, the, the unanimity being the, the silence of the graveyard, um, but but we, uh, we, we've got a huge amount of work to do rebuilding social trust and rebuilding robust dialogue. Um, and museums retain a lot of public trust in this era of eroded public trust. And I wonder if you have thoughts on how we can mobilize that public trust in the post COVID era um, and what lessons we can draw from the, how we've had to operate all of us in our, in our different spheres under the terms of the pandemic um, for, for moving forward. It's obviously been in addition to being traumatic, it's been operationally difficult for a lot of different kinds of organizations and institutions, but it offers us gifts as well, I think. And I, I wonder if you have thoughts on those. Sure, I mean, I, I think that you're right. There are gifts in, in the midst of the silver linings, however we want to describe them, lessons that, are, that we have uh, intentionally or unintentionally opened ourselves up to receive. And I think right now, uh, the, the levels of engagement interaction that we're having uh, give us a lot of clarity into uh, movements that can inform some of our next courses of action, whether it is taking lessons from uh, you know, how the Black Lives Matter movement has um, really strengthened in the midst of a lot of these other uh, kind of chaotic um, 
concerns around the, the pandemic, it's done so uh, kind of despite a lot of the, the, the other pieces that are drawing attention. That's not the only movement. You know, there are things that we're seeing around, uh, you know, the Chinatown Arts Brigade or like decolonize these places like this. There are a few other movements that inform how we can use different mediums to be able to, that are not just gathering, although gathering is important, uh, to give us clarity and to allow for more people to understand ways in which they can contribute. And it's not just uh, top down. So you, you don't have organizations that are in the past, it may have been you know, these multi-year plans and here's the kind of top down approach of how we're going to be you know, pushing this agenda. You, know, you, have, uh, you, know, you have staffers, you have people that are at all points, whether they work in cultural institutions, they attend them. There's this, again, this, um, this democratization of, of voices. Uh, of all walks of life and all places in which they intersect with these these common spaces. And I think that's giving a level playing field for voices to emerge. And this means that we're getting more ideas, more kind of thoughtful discourse, and more clarity in which we can kind of gravitate towards the ideas that we can enact and operate on right now. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of excited about it, but I'm also clear that, again, museums have got to orient themselves in a way in which they are creating the space for these conversations to happen, and that they are, they, they have, there's a history of curation um, for particular narratives. And I think that that is a, a skill set that needs to be applied towards this kind of new normal of a place where the actions we take cannot be passive. They must be active. They must be something in which we are um, we are moving forward with a a, a clear sense of, of justice as a as a driving factor. Um, because again, there's no room on the sidelines for us not to be using these amazing institutions towards that end. Right. Not to mention every other social resource at our disposal, but the, exactly. the one in question <laughs> museums, must be mobilized. Um, I'm, I, I, I don't know if you've been um, able to somehow mysteriously and magically look at the camera and also check out the cue cards, but what you were just saying meshes beautifully oh. with a couple <laughs> of questions that we just were getting from the audience about how museums can be activist in this time and I think specifically, if I can put a, a, a level of nuance in it that also comes from, from the audience, um, and thank you everybody for taking us up on our invitation to engage so, so, uh, so actively. Um, there's, a, there's a real question of tone that we face here talking about these interlocking crises, but let's narrow it to the climate crisis uh, for, for um, purposes of this question. We, we don't want to sugarcoat the reality. We can't insult the intelligence of our audience at every age, frankly, uh, including kids. First, on the second hand, apocalyptic narratives um, uh, can work for, um, for late night science fiction reading, uh, but they don't work to inspire action, um, or at least in our view, they don't. W what's your view of that? I mean, Make no mistakes. I, I am a, a, a large consumer of apocalyptic uh, fiction um, and reality, to be honest. Um, and so <laughs> it is, it's not lost on me that I'll take whatever motivators are available at my disposal. And I, but I agree like, uh, from a, a standpoint that fear is not a, the best motivator, right? So it's not something in which we are looking and need to uh, constantly beat everyone over the heads of with uh, with the fear factor of what's to come. But keep in mind, we are experiencing some of the devastating impacts of a changing climate right now. People are suffering right now. And that means that if we don't acknowledge that, if we don't acknowledge that suffering in a way that is uh, empathetic and thoughtful and intentional, then we we don't we do a disservice to those that we are trying to provide uh, assistance and clarity to. So I do think there it is a, an important balance to be able to do that. But, but I think that you know, people are smart, man. It's like, it's, they're not, it's not something in which we are, uh, we have to sugarcoat everything. I think you can, we can be honest and rely on transparency to be able to disarm uh, and allow a transparency to be able to give us the freedom to have important dialogues that that go alongside 
uh, the the actions that we need to take. So I'm I'm more in line with let's put it all the information out there, good and the bad, and let's let's talk about it and let's make sure that we are not um, we're not putting ourselves in 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 kind of a place where we are aren't learning from the historical mistakes of trying to uh, over control a narrative so that we can get a result that's oftentimes good for some people and not for others. And and how do we how do we also integrate a sense of a positive future? You spoke a lot in our earlier conversation about the special skills that architects and designers that that museum curators have in helping us imagine um, a, a future that's both bright and plausible. Um, what what um, lessons do you think we can draw from and for the sector going forward as the need intensifies for those kinds of narratives that people can believe in? Another another at another recent event that we did, um, the NASA climate modeler Kate Marvel, um, and it, if anything gives you a reason to be direly pessimistic about everything, it's probably it would probably be being a NASA climate modeler. Uh, but Kate spoke movingly about how um, her charts and graphs, while they're indispensable, aren't what move people uh, forward together, aren't what move people to take collective action. It's rather the vision of a future um, that, that feels both achievable and desirable. Yeah, I think that, you know, from the skill set, and again, I, I come to this as, a, as an architect, and I think of a lot of the ways in which I look at problem solving from that point of view. Uh, but architects, designers, I mean, even, you know, other professionals in kind of the cultural arts and, and museums as well, uh, we have the ability to, to put pen to paper. And that is, a, that is a unique skill. And that skill allows for us to help others envision like really envision a future and what that future could look like. And that skill should not be undervalued. And the question then comes, what is the future that we are actually moving towards? And how are we helping others to be able to articulate, understand and envision that, and then ultimately make decisions that work towards it. So I think that the, you know, the job of an architect, again, it's always as this kind of three dimensional problem solver, and you're kind of trying to pack and unpack the built environment in a way that makes it more digestible to people. And I don't think that is inconsistent with the demands of the day. The day demands that we do that unpacking and that we do that articulation of a future that is inclusive, a future that makes sure that we are uh, not just preparing folks for the challenges to come, but doing so in a way that is actually empowering more people to, to, to do that. And I think that visualization does an amazing, amazing job of giving people hope and giving people direction. And we'll always do our job to add additional support to that, uh, that narrative through policy work and through creating more, um, I think, standards of, of how we articulate that. But the role of, of creatives is more important now than ever because we have to be able to see where, where we're going and we have to be able to envision that. And I think that the time now is to kind of step up and begin to fill in the lines for people to understand. Exactly. And, and within that, the, um, the idea of collective action and inclusivity um, comes very much to the fore, I think, for me the the at the climate museum we're constantly um talking to people who are worried about the climate crisis but not yet speaking about it or otherwise taking civic action on it and one of the reasons for that is that people feel and this is a perfectly reasonable conclusion to draw people feel outscaled by the scope of the climate crisis there are a lot of other reasons why we've been slow to act collectively on, on climate. And we have programming that directly addresses, for example, um, the absolutely dire lying of the fossil fuel industry in the pipeline that we'll be presenting soon. But another critical aspect of it is that sense of being overwhelmed and outscaled. And also, crucially, that sense of being complicit in the crisis that we face. 
And that can lead to um, a kind of paralysis um, and a sense that consumer actions, individual consumer actions are the only way that you can make a contribution to climate progress. And while we're all for people taking whatever consumer actions they, they want to take that help alleviate uh, the scope of what we face and help, help mitigate emissions, um, we know that collective action in the end on a very massive scale across the society and its institutions is going to be required and that that has to be totally inclusive and lowercase d democratic. Um, and both museums as a space and city government, city policy as a space, how cities speak with and to um, their residents are really important vectors for building that sense of collective possibility in a community of effective action and direction. Um, and I, I wonder, I wonder if that if that parallel strikes you as well. I, I believe it does. I mean, I believe it does kind of give us uh, a little bit more clarity around where we should be focusing our attention. Uh, I'm. You will often find me telling people to bring you know their reusable bag or their reusable bottle wherever they can uh, and because that is a, at minimum what everyone should be doing uh, but i i think that the narrative that if i don't bring that bottle or i don't bring that bag that i am single-handedly responsible for the devastation and destruction of of the world around us is a, it's a false narrative it's not it's not that we shouldn't be doing these things of, of course absolutely but the reality is that there are upstream choices that are that are constantly made to provide us with options that are not sustainable. And that means that in the fight to be able to continue having a livable planet and continue having a place for our species to, to hang out, uh, we have to be putting our attention in the right places. And if we want to talk about the, the entrenchment of the fossil fuel industry into the choices that we make and the plastics that we consume and, and use through, it's, it's everywhere. And that means that if we're actually going to have significant change, we have to be focusing a lot of our attention there. And the way in which we focus our attention on some of the upstream uh, decision making is through massive, massive movements from our federal government. And our federal government has to be able to mobilize the resources needed for us to be able to decarbonize and shift many different layers of our economy to a place in which we are having a negative impact on, uh, I say negative meaning uh, not a, a bad impact, but the, which we were having a, a lesser um, terrible impact on the world around us. And I think that is something that is 100% clear from the point of view of those of us working every day and night in cities to be able to muster up as much effort as we can, it's, we can only do so much. States can only do so much. We need a federal government and we need to be able to truly um, push uh, in a way that is generational for the challenges that are in front of us. All right. And, and I, I, I see in my mind a kind of a virtuous spiral. We need civic action and collective action um, and, and action by cultural institutions, building the climate conversation, changing the atmosphere for the creation of policy at all the different levels of government, cities taking up leadership roles. Um, New York City has had a massive role on climate from divestment of pension funds um, to the, the work of ensuring that New York City's climate action is inclusive and just and equitable um, which you've been focused on. And all of, all of these things together can add up to a sea change that both supports and demands climate action um, at a federal level. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's notable that in the um, very alarming debate that many of us watched the other night, um, two things. First, that originally it wasn't plan for there to be a question on the climate crisis at all. Um, and there was a tremendous amount of pushback about this and people speaking out. Um, and the moderator, Chris Wallace, ended up, as people who watched the debate know, adding a question about the climate crisis. So uh, just a small um, 
shout out for that form of climate action. People responded to the question list, he changed it and climate was on the docket. That's that's really significant. Um, and um, it, 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 it's also um, the case that we saw a, a massive contrast um, between being absolutely nowhere um, and being able to, in a meaningful way, um, vote climate. So people's outcry in response to the climate silence of that debate um, is a little bit of an example of how breaking the climate silence in general can help us all move forward. Absolutely. I want to ask and being able to, to do that, I think, just to add to your point, being able to see how collective action works in real time, I think is is one of the most powerful things that um, that we're witnessing, especially with everyone being uh, kind of uh, all connected a lot more virtually than they have been. Very much agreed. Um, we, I'm going to I'm going to put out a last call for questions uh, to the to the audience members. We're coming up toward the toward the end of our show. Um, so please um, hurry up and stick a question in there if if you have one that you'd like us to address. Um, this is a question from Joyce Lee. Hello, Joyce. I know you. Um, about the exchange of information between the two coasts of the U.S. Uh, and in particular between museums living through the fires out on the West Coast um, and those of us who are who are on the East Coast um, who are not in this season, have not yet in this season faced any climate disasters unlike a number of other regions in the country. Um, how, how does the dialogue across the sector of, affect how we're thinking and talking about these things? And I'll start off, Mark, by saying um, that this competition is, as I mentioned in the film, super inspiring to me and very heartening because it represents something that's starting to feel like a movement of cultural institutions taking action on climate, forming coalitions. There have now been two international symposiums on museums and the climate crisis, one of them organized by one of the organizers of this design competition, uh, Henry McGee, and a number of other uh, efforts, including for People and Planet, which is led by the Natural History Museum in the UK, which is, um, as, as many watching know, just a, a massive institution with huge cultural trust and traction. Um, and so we're getting on the basis of long years of work by, by people who've been introducing uh, climate into museum work for years and in several cases, decades now, we really have gotten to a critical point where both the importance of museums for climate and the importance of climate and all that that means, social justice and inclusivity, public health, democratic policy and uh, social trust, because climate is bound up with all of those things, we're seeing that come forward in a new way. And I wonder how you see that reflected either as a museum lover and a culture lover or as um, the administrator of one of the most important efforts on climate in one of the most important cities working on climate in the world. Well, I think that it's important to kind of go back to the, the points I made earlier around the uh, when there's an absence of a lot of aggressive federal action, the cities have stepped up. And that stepping up of doubling down on a lot of our commitments has also created a, a dense network of communication uh, that, that in some ways existed before, but has really ramped up uh, in the last uh, you know, three years. And what we've seen is that it creates the opportunity for much more engagement on problem solving. And where we might be typically looking at you know, issues that relate to um, the technical solutions for problems, it has opened up a, a wave of opportunity to be able to align different institutions, whether they be cultural or different components of our economy, together across multiple cities simultaneously. And that means that we have the tools in place the, and the framework to really be able to have, I think, uh, much more uh, systemic action at this, you know, so that we can know that 
I can call our counterparts in, in LA, Seattle, Portland, knowing that they are all currently having various levels of red or purple in terms of their air quality outside and have conversations that relate both specifically to uh, the resources and things that they may need from us, um, but also like how can we amplify the, um, those, those needs and how can we use our platform as the, the, the largest city in the country to be able to make sure we're drawing attention to the specific needs of other places. And I think that's the same kind of framework that I, uh, I think cultural institutions have in this kind of network of, of spaces that they provide uh, is to be able to consistently utilize the, um, the commonality of their, uh, their contribution and then push that towards an end that is, that is being, um, I, I think articulated at the exact same time, which is where you are able to get that momentum and movement that starts to create moments uh, of change as opposed to just kind of exhibits of it. Real change, not just exhibits. <laughs> that's a that's a great great place um, to end this part of the conversation and to to start to wind down. And Mark, I just want to I want to thank you again for being here with us today, and a huge thank you to everyone in the audience. I'm confident that I speak for for Mark um, and his team as 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 well as for the Climate Museum uh, when I say that we hope that this conversation can be a springboard for climate conversations that you have over the coming weeks and months, um, because having a climate conversation with people in your life is one of the most important civic actions you can take. It's not the only one, but it is critically important and people often underestimate its importance, um, but experts tell us it's one of the main ways um, that we will move the needle on climate action and, yeah. and move forward together. Um, so, uh, on the note of climate actions, we also have another one that we spoke about earlier that we'd uh, that we'd like to share with you. So, Mark, I'll ask you to uh, start us off on that. Sure. I mean, I I'll just be plain about it. Uh, go vote. It's incredibly important. You need to vote like your life depends on it. I believe it does. Uh, I think that um, you know past elections have consequences, um, and I think that. It's important for all of us to recognize that when we mobilize to be able to vote, that's when that's our opportunity to showcase our values. And I, I, I can't or won't tell you who to vote for, um, but I will say that please get out there and vote. Please have a plan to vote. Please have a plan B to vote. Uh, if you have the time and ability, please volunteer to be a poll worker. Um, and I think that it's critically important that everyone that has the opportunity to vote early, please do so if that's convenient for you. Um, but just remember the, the, the polls are open. November 3rd is fast, quickly approaching. Um, the, there are uh, critical, critical needs that the world and challenges the world is, face, is facing. And that is an opportunity for all of you to be able to voice your opinion about what matters and voice your opinion about um, you know, the challenges that we're facing and the, the challenges that will impact my ability and Miranda's ability and a lot of other people's ability to utilize the resources at our disposal to be able to, to effectuate change, to be able to truly impact a lot of the, the challenges that we've encountered, including you know, um, 100 plus environmental regulations that have been defunded or, um, or delayed. Uh, and I think that we have an opportunity um, to be able to voice whatever opinion it is that you have. Make sure that you utilize that. Um, I will be voting, and I encourage all of you to do so. And and I'll I'll join you um, in that, Mark, and and add um, vote climate, which I I know um, most of the people uh, watching today would probably be inclined to do. But beyond that, talk about why you're voting climate. Tell people while you're why you're voting climate, why that's an important issue to you. Um, and also, regardless of what happens in the election, batten down the hatches and be prepared to keep talking climate and keep taking action on climate of different kinds after the election, um, because this is a, a struggle with um, a, a short-term horizon, a mid-term horizon, and a horizon that extends past what most human minds can accommodate. Um, so uh, we have a 
we have a sprint now and it's right to sprint and then rest um, and, and get ready for the longer struggle ahead. Um, Mark, if I can bring you back over um, to just offer you the most profound and sincere thanks for all the time you've spent working on this program together. Uh, it's been a huge pleasure for us on our team and for me personally, and, and I hope you guys have enjoyed it too on your end. Um, and I know from what I'm seeing uh, from uh, our team that uh, the audience has, has found it hugely rewarding as well to hear from you. So thank you for the work that you do and thank you for sharing your time with us. It is, it is precious. No, thank you, Miranda. I can't thank you enough. Uh, what you do, what the Climate Museum does, uh, it is a critical part to all of the work that we are trying to champion and trying to um, consistently express uh, a need for. And so I think that this program has been an amazing thing to be a part of, but more importantly, being able to um, rely on the work that you are doing as a kind of constant beacon of, of both hope as well as inspiration is something that is incredibly valuable, um, <clears throat> both to me and my office, but I think to all of us as New Yorkers. So it's much appreciated. Thank you so much. That is, that, th those kind words mean so much to all of us. Thank you very, very much, Mark. I also want to um, thank in a very special way the organizers of the design competition that inspired this conversation and that is so such a strong manifestation of, of the way forward. Um, Colin Sterling, Rodney Harrison, Henry McGee, who I mentioned earlier in the Glasgow Science Center. Um, please do check out the link and um, stay tuned uh, for the outcomes from that. It's a, a very, very exciting process to be part of. Um, thanks to all of you out there for sharing your thoughts and your equally precious time with us. Your input has been fantastic to receive um, and we hope to get more of it. We'll be sending a survey out shortly out after the program. And in these days when we can't connect with you in person, uh, being able to get your responses um, online is so helpful to us. When it's constructive criticism, it makes us better for next time. Um, and when it's a positive response, it helps us make the case for the resources that we need to support to do this kind of work. So we hope that you guys will fill out the survey and let us know what you, what you thought of the program. Um, finally, um, we hope that you join our community and follow us. At the Climate Museum, we're looking to build community and culture for action on the climate crisis. We're so grateful for your time today, um, but we're not easily satisfied. We're gluttonous and we'd love to have more of your time in the future. So please follow along, subscribe and join with us in working toward a cultural shift for action across the society on the climate crisis. Mm -hmm.